In this first video about ozone, we're going to talk a little bit about what the ozone layer is and what the sort of standard set of chemical reactions are that govern it. So we call it the ozone layer, and uh, this is a bit of a misnomer because it's not a it's not like a noticeable layer that you would go through, um, but it is a region of the atmosphere where there is a higher concentration of ozone than in the rest of the atmosphere. So this uh, particular region is in the lower part of the stratosphere. And ozone, of course, is O3. We would draw a Lewis dot structure. I guess if I were formally drawing a Lewis dot structure, then I would go ahead and assign all of these electrons to it. Um, but what we really have here, of course, is a resonance structure where these extra electrons are delocalized into uh, equal bonds on either side. So we have one bond strength governing the, uh, the overall <clears throat> ozone molecule. So this is considered good ozone as opposed to the bad ozone that happens at ground level uh, is considered an air pollutant because it irritates your lungs and can be toxic. Um, so good ozone absorbs ultraviolet radiation from about 200, I'm going to put a squiggle here because it's not exactly, about 200 to 300 nanometers. Um, and it absorbs this really well, which prevents those wavelengths From reaching us. Down here at ground level on the earth. And you are aware that this is ultraviolet radiation and it's pretty high uh, energy ultraviolet radiation so if we did not have the ozone protecting us then a good chunk of this radiation would reach the earth and potentially increase the amounts of things like sunburns and damage to plants and all kinds of stuff. So there is a natural cycle of ozone production and destruction. And these were investigated, you know, ozone in the ozone layer, it seems like it's a long way up, um, but you can find evidence of different gases in the atmosphere using spectroscopy. And so even a hundred years ago, people were paying attention to this, and a scientist named Sidney Chapman figured out the sort of the cycle that ozone goes through in about 1930. And so the Chapman reactions are effectively a reaction mechanism showing the production and the destruction of ozone. So the Chapman reactions we usually write as four reactions or four steps in a reaction mechanism. So in our first step we have a gaseous oxygen molecule and it gets bombarded by a photon. And the photon has to be pretty energetic, 240 nanometers or higher in energy I should say, so it's going to be shorter wavelength than uh, 240 nanometers and this photon splits apart in oxygen and makes these oxygen radicals. So remember this oxygen if we break that bond has unpaired electrons. So that makes it highly reactive. So this highly reactive oxygen radical that's hanging out will immediately bump into an oxygen and probably something else like a nitrogen or another oxygen and it will bond with the other oxygen molecule and then this M will be a, a high energy. And the reason why these are included is because this is a vibrationally excited molecule. And this M is almost always either nitrogen or oxygen gas, which makes sense, right? Because 
oxygen or nitrogen gas is about 78% of our atmosphere and oxygen is about 21 and so <laughs> we've got 99% of the of the atmosphere made up of nitrogen and oxygen so statistically these are the most two the two most likely gases for us to encounter and so what happens with this vibrationally excited molecule is that it will slowly give off the energy as heat So we can see what the temperatures are like in the stratosphere and in the troposphere. I have a little figure here. So notice that at ground level we have uh, pretty comfortable temperatures here, um, what we would call approximately room temperature, right? And as we go toward the top of the troposphere, our temperature decreases pretty significantly, but then it starts to increase again in the stratosphere. And as we head toward the end of the stratosphere, uh, we see that that is where our maximum uh, temperature happens in the stratosphere and it continues to be pretty high until we get toward the mesopause and then the temperature is going up again. Um, but right here is where we kind of want to pay attention to it, right? That what's going on in the stratosphere is that these excited or vibrationally excited nitrogen and oxygen molecules that happen when we break up an oxygen molecule are going to release some of their heat energy into the stratosphere and that's going to warm it. So we have warmer temperatures up here by the ozone layer than we do down here below it. So this is an important uh, warming and it's another way that the energy from the sun gets redistributed into the earth. So these were my first two steps in the Chapman reactions and notice that the net result of this, uh, this reaction right here, is that we have a net production of ozone. Okay, I'm not going to worry about the balanced equations here right now. So in our next step, the ozone is hanging out and it gets hit by a photon and it breaks off one of those oxygens. And this is going to be for wavelengths less than 325 nanometers. And then that oxygen radical that's hanging out, it's another ozone and turns it into oxygen. And notice that these reactions have a net destruction of ozone. Okay, so this is sort of the summary of the Chapman cycle. And in the stratosphere, of course, we have a lot of ultraviolet radiation. So uh, we tend to get a pretty good balance. The Chapman cycles describe the interaction of oxygen molecules with light, oxygen and ozone molecules with light, and the result is that we have a fairly consistent level of ozone in the stratosphere, mostly. And most of the year, this is the truth. We're going to end up seeing that there's a little bit of seasonal variation that's going on, um, but we're going to look at that one in our next video. So these, these four reactions describe basically just what's happening with the O2 and the O3. But there are other mechanisms for destroying ozone as well. Okay, um, but before we get into this, I want to stop and think about the energy of the Chapman cycle. So I'm going to rewrite it so we can take a look at it all right in front of us here. In one, we had O2 plus energy gives us two 
O's. In two, we have O plus O3 giving us O3 oh, plus M. In three, we have an O3 encountering light. In four, we have the destruction. So let's think about who is active in here and what the activation energies might be like in these different reactions. So if we think about oxygen, oxygen has a double bond. It's a pretty strong bond. And until we have this energy breaking it, then this is probably our slowest reaction, right? This is a strong bond. And usually when we have a, uh, a reaction where we've got the collision of molecules uh, getting us activation and taking place, our activation energies are going to be on the order of 80 to 200 kilojoules per mole for um, when we have like A plus B making products. So let's look at this next reaction. And I'm going to point out the oxygens here. These are radicals. And anytime you have a radical reacting with a molecule, this is going to be super fast. So if we have a A plus some B star, oh, not a B star. I'm going to change that, and I'm just going to call it a radical. It's too confusing to try and say it otherwise. So if I have a molecule plus a radical, this is going to have a much lower activation energy, anything from zero up to maybe about 60 kilojoules per mole. And then, of course, if we have two radicals, that's a C-A-L. I'll just rewrite it. then this is basically zero activation energy. So anytime we have a radical, our activation energy is going to be much lower. And even a molecule like ozone is a pretty reactive molecule. It's reactive enough that you effectively can't store it. Nobody has tanks of ozone hanging out anywhere. If they want it, they just have to make it right then and use it immediately. So we have a reaction like two and four. These are going to be extremely fast reactions. And the only one that's kind of slow is this first one. And of course, once you get up into the stratosphere, it's not as slow because you have quite a bit of uh, solar radiation depending on the season. And we'll get back to the season here in a little bit. So in our Chapman cycle, it's that first reaction that's going to be slow. But even so, this tends to balance out and uh, we end up with a fairly consistent amount of ozone. And this mostly has to do with the fact that there's not a ton of this O around this O radicals. And so because this first reaction is slow, yeah, it's going to um, make, oops, sorry, there's a typo here. This should be another O2. I was wondering why that looked funny. OK, so there's not a lot of oxygen radicals present because, of course, we said this reaction is slow. And so because of that, there's not a lot of oxygen radicals present to destroy the ozone either. So now we get to go ahead and talk about some of these other mechanisms for destroying ozone. So remember that I talked about how a hydroxyl radical is a good cleaner of the atmosphere. Let's take a look at how hydroxyl radical can clean the oxygen, or excuse me, the ozone out of the radical. So we're going to have a, another reaction mechanism. And in our first step, our hydroxyl radical can encounter one of the ozone molecules up in the stratosphere and make this really crazy HO2 plus O2. The HO2 doesn't hang out long and react with presumably some random 
oxygen radical to make hydroxyl radical and O2. So if we look at the net reaction here, this is what we get when we add these two reactions vertically. We're going to end up with, as a net reaction, O plus, O3 plus O, giving us 2O2, right? Um, because these guys cancel out and these guys cancel out. So I just said these guys cancel out, which is why they don't appear in the net reaction. But let's identify what they are, right? So take a look at this. We've talked about species like this one, like the HO2, they get produced and then they get used up. Remember, we called this a reaction intermediate. But we also have this OH that goes in and then comes out and doesn't appear in our net reaction. So remember in a previous lecture I talked about catalysts and I said catalysts don't appear in your net reaction because they don't get used up. They get regenerated again later on. And this is exactly what's happening right here. Although in step one, we use that hydroxyl radical. In step two, the hydroxyl radical is regenerated, and so it can go out and catalyze this again. And it can go over and over and over through this cycle. So when we have a chemical reaction like this one that is being catalyzed by a radical like hydroxyl, this is called a chain reaction. and I'll go ahead and write out that definition for you. So this is a chemical reaction. It is catalyzed by a radical. And in this chain reaction step, it's catalyzed by a radical and each step contains a highly reactive species like a radical or something similar. And the reason why this is important is because if each step contains a highly reactive species, then each step is super fast. And the whole reaction is very fast. Chain reactions have three stages. The three stages are initiation, propagation, and termination. So we'll go ahead and go through and identify these steps. Um, as we look at how another reactive chemical species, nitric oxide, can also destroy ozone. So, nitric oxide is one of those highly reactive species, um, but how does it get there? That's what the initiation step is about. The initiation has to get us that reactive species. So, uh, one example would be that at high temperatures, for example, in a lightning strike or in the combustion happening inside a jet engine, you can get nitrogen and oxygen to react together and turn into nitric oxide gas. And this is actually non-trivial. Um, the amount of nitric oxide produced by jet engines is not huge but it's enough that uh, we recommend not flying in these sort of suborbital flights um, through the stratosphere so we don't produce extra nitric oxide and destroy ozone. So this is our initiation in that it produces some nitric oxide. So then the next step would be propagation. And in the propagation step, the nitric oxide is uh, doing its destruction. So in our first step, we'll have that nitric oxide 
interact with an ozone, form another compound, and break off one of those oxygens to make oxygen atoms to make oxygen molecule. And then the NO2 reacts with an oxygen radical in the atmosphere to make nitric oxide and O2. So again, just like before, our net reaction is O3 plus O making two oxygen molecules. The nitric, nitrogen dioxide is a reaction intermediate and the radical nitric oxide is regenerated and that's the catalyst. And so then assuming that there's oxygen to react with, oxygen atoms, the nitric oxide can go and break down, this same nitric, nitric oxide can go and break down one ozone molecule after another until we get to the termination step. So in the termination step, the radical gets deactivated by something. So for example, we could just have a reverse of that initiation step where two, oops, I need an arrow here. Two nitric oxide molecules encounter each other in just the right way to recombine as nitrogen gas and oxygen gas. So that might be one way. Uh, we also might have this situation where those two radicals, nitric oxide and oxygen, will combine with each other instead and form a nitrogen dioxide. And this is still a free radical, but it doesn't make up one of the um, sort of catalysts of this chain, and so it will still terminate the chain, even though it does get involved as a reaction intermediate. So when we look at this overall catalyst, we can, you know, sort of conclude with a generic uh, radical catalyst process. And that generic process is that we have some radical X that reacts with an ozone. This is our step one and it picks up one of the oxygens, leaving an oxygen molecule, and in the next step, that XO intermediate reacts with another atmospheric oxygen atom to form another oxygen molecule and regenerate that catalyst. So this is what worked for the nitric oxide and also the hydroxyl radical, giving us the same net reaction Oops, I need another arrow. Great. This generic radical catalyst process is one that we see happening uh, over and over to destroy uh, ozone, um, but it's also one that can be terminated and that we understand pretty well. So we're gonna pause right now and in my next video, because I'm trying not to make my videos too long, in the next video we're going to talk about uh, ozone destruction by other means and then some of the implications of it.